morning, everyone. How are you all today? All right. All right. It's always good to be out the Lord's house and hear it and enjoy that great worship that we had and all our special singers and the music. It's a wonderful blessing. And uh, I'd like to ask you to turn open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We was there last Sunday morning as well. No matter of fact, last week we began our journey in the series on sin. Last week we examined the biblical definition for sin and, and what it means and how it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just a recap and a, and a brief, I guess, just a thesis statement from last week. We, we talked that sin is breaking the law. It's a failure to do what is right. It's to violate God's moral standards. And we related what sin is then to what the gospel is. The gospel is facts to believe, commands to obey, and promises to receive. Remember one of those scriptures we emphasized was actually Romans 6.23 that said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know this morning we're going to talk about some different aspects of sin. You know, sin, you, you can you can park the bus on, on many different corners around sin and, and talk about it from many different angles and in just a wide, diverse subject. You know, I was back home a couple of days ago and, and I was talking to my sister and she had some questions about sin. And you know, as brothers and sisters do, we always like to pick on each other. And I said, well, you know, what's your, what's your question about sin? What, what are you having problems with? And she told me, she said, well, you know, I, I can't help thinking this, but she said, you know, I think i got a problem with a little bit of sin. When I go to church, I can't help but thinking I'm the, I'm the prettiest girl in the whole congregation. And I told her, I said, well, you know, uh, I want to let you know, I, I don't think that yours is a case as much as it is sin is, is a horrible mistaken identity. <laughs> But this morning, we're going, to do, we're going to look at sin again from another angle. So if you've got your Bibles over there to Romans <laughs> chapter 3, let's start reading the end of verse 21. The bangle, the bangle. The bangle, the bangle. <laughs> but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, and faith in Jesus Christ to all, and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your heads in and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and just seeking you earnestly. And Lord, as we discuss sin this morning, let us not forget that there is also a Savior for that sin. And that any here this morning that are, that are struggling in our lives that may not know you as their Lord and Savior who are caught in the web of sin, that this morning, Lord, they will know that they can come and they can accept you as their Lord and Savior and be free from that tangle. That they can experience eternal life. They can experience a relationship with you. They can experience peace. They can experience a fulfillment and a purpose in their life that they have never seen elsewhere and never will apart from you. Lord, if there's any here this morning that, that are your children that may be struggling, Lord, let this be an enlightenment in their life to break free from those bondages. Be with us now and pour down your grace and your spirit down upon your people for the sake of glorifying your Son, Jesus Christ, in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we discussed what we talked about last week and when we introduced this. Now let's go ahead and dive into what we're, what we're going to discuss this week. You know, Paul here in, in verse 23, he, he talks about that all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. You know, man is not a sinner because he sins. Man sins because he is a sinner. There, there's a big difference. But I want to talk to you this morning about why is it that we sin? And that, that's the first point that we're going to talk about this morning. Is the cause for sin. What causes us to sin? What, what is it that tempts us into the, into the dilemma of, of always wanting to sin? The first problem that, and the cause of sin is that it has a very pleasurable side to it. 
Matter of fact, the Bible puts it this way in, in Hebrews 11. And, and before we read this little scripture passage, I want to remind you. If you remember all the people in the Old Testament, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, that these people were an example for us today in the New Testament. It, it brought about a type of something greater that served in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And as we read this passage of Scripture from Hebrews 11, verse 24, it talks about the pleasure of sin. It says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You know, Moses, he's in the in the hall of faith in that Hebrews chapter. A list of greats such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah. And there's a list of Moses. You know what love for God it must have took to have left Pharaoh's house where he had all the luxuries that could have been afforded to him. He, it was a palace lot. You know, he was there, he had the best of food, he had the best of entertainment, clothes, he lived a life of luxury, he didn't work, he didn't do nothing. But instead, Moses thought that it was more important than partaking of that sinful life in Egypt and Pharaoh's house that he would rather live in the wilderness and tend the sheep with God and be alone. Because he decided not to take for that pleasurable woman of sin. But let's look at what, what it is. It's usually attractive sin is to our senses, isn't it? Isn't that one of the problems with pleasure of sin is that we only think about it in the terms of our flesh? That, that's what Moses was doing basically. He said that basically I denied my flesh the pleasures that I could get with my flesh so that I would be more healthy in my spirit. Because the, the sinful pleasures come from our flesh, especially the eyes. The eyes are one place that causes us to sin more than anything. Christ even made a statement. He said that if, your, if your eye caused you to sin, then you should pluck it out. He wasn't talking about literally taking your eye out. It was more of a metaphor. This is Moses' decision when the, the wealth of the Pharaoh's house leads to the wilderness. And it's that pleasurable side of sin that continues to bind us on earth and bind us from the truth. Let me go into this just a little bit. Now we all got our favorite passage John 3.16. Everybody can probably recite that from heart, right? And that is one of the, one of the most uh, widely quoted scriptures there is in the entire Bible. But you know one of my favorite scriptures is actually the very next verse, John 3.17. John 3.17 says this. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, that's the thing about sin. It is oftentimes we want to keep doing what pleasures us because we fail to submit to God because we're afraid that He's going to condemn us. We get the idea that, well, we've done this, this bad thing. We've done sin. God's going to probably send me to hell for it. So I might as well go out with a bank. I might as well just continue and continue to sin. If I want to be a sinner, man, I want to be the greatest one there was. Well, see, folks, that's a lot. You see, God didn't come to condemn you. But He come rather to save you. As a matter of fact, on down to John 3, 19, it says this, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, but when men love darkness, rather than light, because of these reasons. You see, folks, it's not a matter of if we can come to God. God has already granted forgiveness. It's a matter of just accepting it. But the problem is people don't come to God and accept His forgiveness. It's because they just like to sin. <coughs> the pleasure of doing what the world has to offer is a greater pleasure to them than it is to serve God. That they're seeking what's in the flesh. What they can get with their eyes. What's healthy for them. That's the whole issue. That's the whole cause for sin is we want to do things our own way. In the Garden of Eden, when sin first came in the world. So what did Adam and Eve sin for? They wanted to be like God. You see, they wanted to know the difference themselves between good and evil. They just didn't want to take God's word forward. Throughout the Bible, when we see people sin, it's because they want their own way. We want the pleasures ourselves. What about sin in the church, folks? 
what causes sin most times in the church? Because don't be so naive to think that it doesn't exist. Okay? Just because you get saved and you come to church doesn't mean you don't sin no more. It happens. Paul addressed it. Let's talk about what we do with sin in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about sin. He, he talks about a man who says he's doing something in the church. He says it's so, uh, so much of an abomination. He said the heathens don't even do it. He was committing sexual immorality with his, with his father, his wife. He said the heathens don't even do something this bad. And here it is going on in your church. And folks, things like this go on in churches still today. Don't think they do. What Paul, how does Paul tell us to deal with sin? What does he say is the number one cause for sin in the church? You see, it ain't just that something would, would happen like this because anybody can fall into sin. But where the greater sin comes into the church is when we fail as a body to be compassionate to that sin, to give that sin attention, approach them, and restore them back to the body. And that's what Paul was giving instructions for in Corinthians. Indifference is the greatest cause of sin in the church. Not caring, not being sympathetic to it, just trying to ignore it, hoping it will go away, none of my business. Leave it alone. You see, folks, we're a body for a reason. If one hurts, we all should hurt. If one rejoices, we all should rejoice. Because of indifference running rampant in the church, all kinds of sin indulge weak members of the congregation. And they do it without fear of reprimand. You see, those that are stronger should be helping those that are weaker. That's one of the purposes. But how do we relate to sin in the church? That's a good question. Let's, let's look at it. Let's look at how we do it. Because we have a couple problems. How do we teach about Christ and brotherly love and forgiveness when people among us are sinning? How do we go about people and, and help them deal uh, with, with brotherly love and the kindness that Christ teaches, but also at the same time teach them about the harsh judgment that the Bible so often warns about? Because there's both, folks. There's love and forgiveness, but there's judgment also. You, you can't have one without the other. And we worry so much that if we try to approach someone and, and, and out of love talk about their sin, one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to appear to be critical of the people we're coming to that are caught in sin, and we're going to appear to lack love and compassion. They're going to think, well, that person is just cold as ice. Or the second thing is if we've ever pointed out a sin in the church, we're going to appear to be judgment, judgmental. We're judgmental. That's what you're going to be scared of. But unfortunately, really, Rather than find out what the Word says about these matters, what does the Bible, how does it say to deal with sin in the church, instead of going and seeing how Paul dealt with sin in Corinthians, and see and see how Christ dealt with sin that was happening in the body, instead of doing this, how does most people in the church deal with sin? Here's how we deal with it. We get with our own packs that maybe are or the groups, and we isolate ourselves and we just gossip about it. Did you see what so and so doing, man? Can you believe that? Then they come to church on Sunday morning. Praise yeah, man. <laughs> what about that? Isn't that the truth? Because that's just as bad as not worse. That's just as bad as not worse than what the person's doing in the Y'all see, God doesn't see sin the same way we do. It's all negative from Him. Sin is sin in Him. The Bible says this. In Matthew 7, it says, Judge not that ye not be judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be measured to you again. Jesus tells you not to judge unless you yourself can be judged. He warns that the judgment that you judge of somebody else, basically the measuring stick he used will be the measuring stick that's used on you. You see, folks, let's, let's put this into proportion. Let's put this in context. <laughs> Jesus here is, not, is telling us that to not be at fault with motives, but be concerned with our own. It's a common conclusion then that, that the fault we readily see in the motives of others. It's because all those down to motives. And what's your intention of coming to someone and helping them with the sin? Is it pointing them out to be condemnation, to be judgmental? 
Is it to be cold as ice or are you actually doing it out of love? Because the Bible says if you are, you're going to go to that person one on one. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, it tells us that in 18, it tells us when a brother sins, it says we're going to go to them in private. One on one. It means we don't go to a group gospel about it. We don't explore it in church. We go to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then if they don't respond, we take a brother with us. And then if they don't respond, we, we take it before the church. That's how we handle it. But folks, what oftentimes we need to be worried about, the reason one that I wanted to mention, is sin in the church, if we find ourselves in these situations, is a greater signal or sign of something else that's happening rather in our own lives. Because if you readily find fault in the motives of others, and you find fault in what other people are doing, and you can see that your motives are not sincere or true in helping someone else develop a closer relationship to God, well then the faults that you're seeing in someone else are usually the faults that you have found in yourself that you're just not confessing. It's a way it's coming out. It's a way that's manifesting itself because you, you point the finger at other people because it's really inside yourself but you don't want to confess it or admit it because it makes you feel better or makes you feel like you're closer to God the more you can put somebody else down. You see, if I can make them look worse, it makes me look better. Amen. Ain't that what they're doing politics? If I can sling enough mud on this guy, then it'll make me look a little cleaner. But you're still dirty. Amen. He doesn't really have... You see, that's not how it works. Because how we get rid of sin is by our next point, and that's the confession of sin. Confession is how sin is brought about and got rid of. To believe in Christ addresses the love of sin. Here's what it says in 1 John chapter 10. In John chapter 1 verse 10. It says, He came to His own. His own was not received. But as many received to Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. To those who believe in His name. You, you ever thought about what does it mean to believe? <laughs> if you say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. You ask people all the time, you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yeah, I believe. You probably have people ask you that before. What's that mean to believe? What are you professing when you say that you believe in Jesus Christ? Belief is the action of faith. It's faith with legs on it. It's when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that the race of the dead will be saved is what Paul describes in Romans. For with the heart one believes in righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is why believing in Jesus Christ the belief means two things. It's when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in that, we are saying this. We're saying that we believe that Christ is who He said He is. Mm -hmm. You think about that. When you say that you believe in Jesus Christ, or you really believe He was who He said He is. Because Jesus Christ can only be one of three people. He was either a lunatic, he was either the biggest liar that ever lived, or he was the Son of God. One of three. Do you believe that he is who he says that he is? And the second thing when you say you believe is this. Do you believe that he can do what he said he could do? Do you believe that he rose out of that grave? Do you believe that he said that he can do what he said he can do? Do you believe that he said that he can forgive sins that he can do it? Do you believe that when he said that he can give you eternal life if you believe on him that he can do it? Do you believe him that when he said he shed his blood for you, it paid for your sins? Do you believe it paid? Do you believe he can do what he said he did? That's what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And once you come to a belief, and you understand what believing is. You understand that believing is you, 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 He is who He says He is. Jesus Christ is Lord. He can do what He said He's going to do because He is God. Then you are enlightened to come to the point in your life with sin that you can now experience these two things. You will learn to hate sin. You see, sin don't become pleasurable anymore. 
You see, when we were sinners, sin was very pleasurable. We, we enjoyed it. We liked to do it. It brought pleasure to ourselves. But once you come to the belief in Jesus Christ and these two aspects, and that's, these two aspects are fundamental in your faith, then you will learn to hate sin. And the reason you'll hate it is because Jesus hates it, and you will hate what He hates. Because it hurts Him. Mm -hmm. You see, folks, when you sin in your life, the thing that should bother you the most is, is not what is God going to do to me. Most Christians, when they <coughs> sin, they want to run to this altar because they have, have been, they know all week that they have been sowing the seeds of sin. And when we sow seeds, we're going to reap a harvest. So they want to come Sunday and pray for a crop failure so they don't reap those seeds. But that's all they're worried about is what's going to happen to them because they've sinned. But you know what we really should be concerned about when we sin? Is that we broke the heart of God. Amen. Not because something's going to happen to me. Something already did happen to me. God loved me enough that He saved me. And I broke His heart and went and sinned against Him. That should be our main concern. That should be what we're worried about. That should be what drives us to the altar and repentance. That should be us burns our fuel and causes us to deep a hatred of sin in our heart where we want to expel it in every corner of our life. That is what it is. And when this happens, you become to become like the psalmist who said, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalm 119, 104. And folks, when you experience this, the cause for sin, the confession of sin, then you will come to the cure for sin. And the only cure for sin is Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. You see, Romans 6.23, if you remember what it says. It says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. I mean, we owe debt. We owe a sin debt that has to be paid. It has to be satisfied. Like the man who steals something. A thief that has left the bill, it must be paid. As the man cheats on his wife. Or the wife who cheats on her husband leaves an adultery bill that must be paid. As the man who lies as a false witness bill that must be paid. Amen. As the woman who wants more than what she can pay for has a grief bill that must be paid. As the people who gossip now have a bill of false accusations that must be paid. For those in our lives of whatever sin it is we have committed, it now has a bill on our tab that must be paid. And we cannot pay our sin bill with silver or gold, so it does not matter how much wealth you have acquired in the bank, how much money you may have stashed away, and how much you can go and get where you've accumulated. As the wise Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, he said, I gained it all. But he said, you know what? There's something in this world that's a great equalizer. It has no respect of the wealth, your age, your color, your gender, your creed, your nationality, your origin. Debt. And the debt that must be paid. We all owe it. The wages of sin is death, it said in Romans 6.23. But God therefore gave us a payment plan. Just like a car. And that payment plan is the gift of God and eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The second part of that verse. You see, when you come to this altar to get saved and come to faith in Jesus Christ, there's no word. He doesn't give you an installment on your sins. Where now, I've got these sins paid for, and when I sin some more, I have to go get another installment. You see, He gives you a lump sum and pays for it all. He knows of all your sins you've ever committed and will pay, and pays for it all. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. He paid it all, folks. The whole debt, the entire debt, and all at once. He picked up the entire note. 
And only knew He could do it. The Lamb of God. And as you can hear the cries out from heaven before Jesus came to the earth and died, you can hear God say, is there anybody out here who could pick up this sin debt for the people? I can imagine Moses, who we mentioned a while ago in the beginning of this sermon, who made it to the, the chapter of faith in Hebrew. Lord, I can't do it. I got my hands full dealing with the children of Israel. Anybody here? Elijah may have responded. Lord, I can't do it. It's taking all I have the rest of what they have. Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. Ezekiel may have said, Lord, I can't do it. I'm over my head in the valley of dry bones. Daniel, Lord, I cannot do it. It is taking everything I have to deal with the lions and the den. Three Hebrew boys are too busy walking in the fiery furnace. But then heaven said that there was a voice crying out from Jesus. He said, Lord, send me. He came to earth in the form of a man, a God man, that came on the cross and died not because he had to die. You see, he never committed a sin. There was no reason for him to die. You see, sin is why we die. The wages of sin is death. Everybody must die. Even suicide bombers, they don't choose to die. They choose maybe when to die, but they're still going to die. Jesus Christ was the only man that chose to die because He had no reason to die. Therefore, He can now pay your sin debt in full. As in Revelation, when it says, and they have the scroll, and they're getting ready to open it, and who is worthy? Only the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb. The only one who arose from the grave with all power and set the people free. On whoever should believe in Him, He did not send His Son to condemn the world, but so the world may have eternal life. Amen. As we grow in Christ, folks, we become like Him. That is God's goal for us. That is His purpose for us to become like Jesus Christ. And when you become a Christian and you develop in your walk and you've been saved for just a little bit or even when you first come to save, you are probably feeling overwhelmed by the satanic forces that are about you that are saying, look at all that you are doing and you claim to be a Christian. Look at all the sin in your life. Look at all the things you're doing wrong. Brother, we're Folks, home. God will use that. Brother, we're home. Because it's not that you are sinning more. It's that now it's being brought to your attention more. Mm -hmm. So now you can purge yourselves of those sins. God will bring the sin to your attention more. It's not that you're sinning more after you get saved. It's bringing your attention more. And you can become more like Him. Our love for sin will decrease. It will no longer be a pleasure. And as a sinner, we ran to sin. But see, as a Christian, we run from it. I have people ask me sometimes, how do you do that old Baptist stuff? <laughs> I say, well, that's like this. I say, you know, what, how do you guys think on that? I say, well, you know what? They say, you, you believe in that, that you know, that, that thing where you can just sin all you want, can't you? You sin all you want after you get saved. I said, yeah, I do. I, I believe that with all my heart. And I, you know what? I sin all I want. And I don't bad you in. Matter of fact, I sin more than I want. Because I don't want to sin at all. Because when you get saved, you don't want to sin. It's no longer pleasurable. You didn't know You're sinning more than you want to if you sin any. With the paper. And God will bring those sins to your teeth and you begin to, begin to purge yourself. And, and it's not something that happens instantaneously. That. It's something that is a process, a development, a lifetime that you will go through. And we will only achieve it when the Lord takes us to be with Him. In the twinkling of an eye, He transforms us into a perfect human. And we are living with the sinful flesh. That's what we can have. I'm going to close out with this. You know, there was a little boy one time who had a toothache. And he knew that if he went to his mother with that toothache, what was going to happen. So, I mean, he waited until the pain was just completely unbearable. 
Because he knew when he went to his mother with that toothache that she was going to send him to the dentist. And he knew when he got sent to the dentist that doc, that dentist was going to come in there and he was going to check out that tooth. But not only was he going to check out that tooth, but the little boy knew that he would open up his mouth and he would rattle through every teeth he had in his mouth. It wouldn't stop there. And you know what? When you get that tooth repaired, and the pain goes away, and you start examining the other thing, and you find some decay here and there, and you go get them fixed, because just as you go to the dentist and he doesn't stop at one, but he fixed the whole thing. You see, Jesus Christ doesn't just cure us of a particular sin. He cures us of all sin. He gives us the full treatment. The remedy of all. And folks, that's why for this, we don't just tell about sin. But we need to give the whole gospel. That's the experience that the Christ proclaims. You see, we don't just tell our brothers and sisters maybe that, that sin is wrong or sin is, is evil, yes. but we tell them of sin, we do. But we also tell them of the sacrifice that atones for it, of the guilt, but the, the guilt of grace that, that pardons guilt and gets rid of it and, and man's depravity of the redeeming mercy of God. We don't give them half the gospel, folks, but we give them the entire gospel. Yeah, there is sin. It has to be addressed. It has to be confessed. This is part of it. Because God also has mercy. He has forgiveness. He has atonement. And He wants to forgive you and bring you into His arms. Make you a child of His and give you eternal life. I'm the real dad of my child. You see, my last name is Sarge. Where do you put my child? There's nothing in this world that can not make me my daddy's child. My dad's son. Daddy, I'm here. Daddy, home. No matter what happens in this world, I am my dad's son. So when you come to this Maybe altar and accept Jesus Christ, yeah. and God becomes dream. your heavenly Father, there is nothing that can make you not a child of you. So this morning, if you are not a child of God, if you know you're not saved, would you come to this altar and become His and confess your sin, get the cure for sin, and walk out of here as a victorious Christian as we sung the song. Vic Maybe you are a Christian but are struggling with something in your life. And you were going to miss us. You need to get new oil for the year, refreshing and anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know what? That's what we're here for. It's why we're a body. Let's pray with you. We're not here to condemn you. We're not here to, to, to try to tear each other down. We're here to try to build each other up. Amen. We all fall down sometimes. Amen. But you've got people here that love you, that want to pick you up. You see, we don't want to throw mud and, and put dirt on somebody else to make us look cleaner. We want to bend down and pick you up and bring you to Christ and wash you in the blood of Jesus. And let's all be clean. Let's all rejoice. <laughs> At this time, we're going to have an altar call. And in the preciousness of this moment, let this be the time. And when you leave here today, you can truly be singing victory in Jesus. Because today is the day where you become a child of our heavenly God. Would you bow your heads and pray with you? Your Heavenly Father, we come before you to speak with you, Lord, we just thank you for you now. Lord, we thank that you, you made sin known to us, and, and Lord, showed us our depravity that we was in, but Lord, you also granted us forgiveness and eternal life and through the gift of Jesus Christ, that if only we would accept it. Lord, if there's any here that, that hasn't accepted Christ, maybe they would just pray something like this, that, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I confess my sins to you and I ask for your forgiveness. Come into my life and cleanse me, Lord Jesus. Give me the courage to make it public and to walk it out. Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. And Lord, now walk with me. If there's any here, would they come and, and come to the altar, Lord, and, and make it public. Give them the courage to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand in order to make